I want to tell you guys a little bit about the Baha'i faith. And, you know, the Baha'i faith is only a little over 170 years old. And Baha'u'llah, the prophet founder of the Baha'i faith, came to the world to unite humanity. He talked about three onenesses, that of course there is only one God, and that because there is only one God, there is truly only one religion because God cannot be in competition with himself, and that all of humanity is one, and that he came to bring a message to humanity that religion is progressive, and that we are sent messages throughout times in history to bring humanity forward spiritually and socially, but that every chapter is a chapter of the same book, and that he came to unite the world and talk about how vital oneness is. And, you know, one of the things that he shared was about the purpose of justice being to bring about unity in the world. And one of the things that we are talking about here is how it is that our thoughts, can our thoughts shape our world, shape our lives? So I want to take you through a little bit of a personal journey of my own, as is mentioned in the title my own personal journey out of darkness. And growing up as a Baha'i, I heard all of these beautiful quotes and I wasn't sure how to implement them into my life. And often I thought that they were spiritual and esoteric and somewhere kind of outside of me, instead of realizing that they had to really center greatly within myself and that they were actually very literal. So I'm going to share a bit of my own journey today. I'm going to share a PowerPoint presentation, and I'm also going to share a few videos. So I will start with my PowerPoint presentation. So as I mentioned, can our thoughts shape our reality? My own personal journey out of darkness. One of the quotes that I opened up with talked about how the purpose of justice is unity amongst men. And this is a quote from Baha'u'llah. He says, the light of men is justice. Quench it not with the contrary winds of oppression and tyranny. The purpose of justice is the appearance of unity among men. All my life I've read this quote and I've only really truly begun to grasp its meaning. Often we talk about oneness and unity. However, if we don't first have justice, how can we have unity? That's another talk for another day. But just to give an introduction to what we believe as Baha'is, I wanted to really make sure that that is something that I highlighted. Some of the principles of the Baha'i faith is the absolute equality of men and women, the harmony of science and religion, which we're going to go into greatly today, and just a few of the other um, principles is independent investigation of the truth. I could sit here and tell you everything I know about the Baha'i faith, but unless you were to investigate it for yourself, you would never know the truth. So a few years ago, I was going through a very dark period in my life. I had started a business in Washington, DC. I had started two businesses, actually. My first business was quite successful. And sadly, the second business that I opened bankrupted me. And as I was going through that very dark night of the soul, not knowing where to turn, feeling very much like a failure and not knowing where to turn, the only place I could turn was to my spirit. And my spirit was the only thing that kept me alive during that time, my spiritual practice. 
And so I'm going to take you through a little bit of that journey. And one of the quotes that I learned during that time or came across during that time was another quote from Baha'u'llah. He says, build for yourself such houses as the rains and floods can never destroy, which shall protect you from the changes and chances of this life. This is the instruction of him whom the world hath wronged and forsaken. I have read this quote hundreds, if not thousands of times. How is it that we build for ourselves such houses that the rains and floods can never destroy, which shall protect us all from the changes and chances of this life? Haven't we seen that all in the last year and a half dealing with a world pandemic? It's been quite an issue. How is it that we don't allow the rains and the floods to destroy our own personal realities. You know, there's a great thing that talks about in the Baha'i faith about tests. And this is a quote from Abdul Baha. The mind and spirit of man advance when he is tried by suffering. The more the ground is plowed, the better the seed will grow, the better the harvest will be. Just as the plow furrows the earth deeply, purifying it of weeds and thistles, so suffering and tribulation free man from the petty affairs of this worldly life until he arrives at a state of complete detachment. His attitude in this world will be that of divine happiness. Man is, so to speak, unright. The heat of the fire of suffering will mature him. Look back to the times past, and you will find that the greatest of men have suffered most. So during this period of the dark night of the soul that I was going through, I was searching for everything that could uplift me. I was listening to every podcast I could get my hand on. I was listening to Super Soul Sunday and Oprah. I was, you know, finding Abraham Hicks. I was anything that was talking about uplifting my soul was what I was hungry for because everything else around me was falling apart. And I had to know that there was a way out of this darkness. And it was during this time that a dear friend, sister friend from New York, sent me a talk of Dr. Joe Dispenza's. And he talks a lot about how we are the creators of our realities and not the victims of its circumstances. And I wanted to know more. And he wrote a book called Breaking the Habit of Being Yourself. And I was like, I need to read this book because I absolutely need to break the habit of being myself. I could not stand the life that I was living because everything around me was crumbling. I had 15 employees between these two businesses. I couldn't pay my bills. I couldn't just shut off the lights and you know lock up the place because we had leases and issues legally that needed to be attended to. So there was so much pressure on our shoulders that I just had to figure out a way to solve this problem. And in a two-week period at my cafe, my ice cream pasteurizer, I was the, I owned a cafe in DC and we made liquid nitrogen ice cream. I was the first person to bring liquid nitrogen ice cream to the Northeast States. And we won best ice cream two out of five years in the greater DC metro area. And I really believed because every time someone would come into my business at the convention center, if I were to open a brick and mortar and make it a place that not only served delicious foods, but also put love into the food and loved our customers as they came in, that I'd have another thriving business. But after a few years, I saw that that was not going to happen. When they say location, 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 that really is no joke. And I, in a two-week period, my ice cream pasteurizer broke, which was my most expensive piece of equipment that I couldn't afford to be fixed. A few days later, my ice maker broke. 
Um, after that, my espresso machine broke. When you have a cafe and you can't serve espresso based drinks, you're in big trouble. And then finally, the crowning blow was one evening, my door, I had these two beautiful, large glass doors and it got stuck open. And a locksmith told me that it would be $1,200 to shut it. And he wasn't sure that that would fix the problem. And I went home and I was face down on the mat and I didn't know where to turn. And I called a friend who had been helping me through counseling me through some of these issues. And I shared, just unburdened my soul. And she said to me, I am so sorry, Faith. I've got nothing for you. That's <laughs> like, what do you mean you have nothing for me? <laughs> like she was where I went when there was nowhere else to turn. And interestingly, that was exactly what I needed to hear that night because I turned to prayer and meditation in a way that I have never turned before. And the next morning I woke up again, feeling the same way, turning towards prayer and meditation in a way that I have never been able to. And I realized two things in that moment. I realized that the only thing that I am capable of controlling are two things. I can control my actions and I can re control my reactions to things. And those are the only two things that I'm able to have any influence on. So I started to really dive deep into these writings that one of that, which I just shared with you about tests and suffering and said, okay, what is it that I need to learn from this? Because all of us, every single person who is here is not free from tests or suffering. All of us have had challenges. And so what is the purpose of that? Because we must believe that there is a purpose. So I have a few more quotes to share with you and then I'd like to share a short video. And once again, it will not share. I guess I have to, again, please forgive me. Um, one of these days I'm gonna figure this out, okay. So here's another quote on tests. Although outwardly, cataclysms are hard to understand and endure, yet there lies a great wisdom behind them, which appears later. All the visible material events are interrelated with invisible spiritual forces. I want to say that again. I think that's really key to what we're talking about. All the visible material events are interrelated with invisible spiritual forces. The infinite phenomena of creation are as interdependent as the links of a chain. When certain links become rusty, they are broken by unseen forces to be replaced by newer and better ones. There are certain colossal events which transpire in the world of humanity, which are required by the nature of the times. For example, the requirements of winter are cold, snow, hail, and rain. But the birds and animals who live for six months enjoy a short span of life, not realizing the wisdom of winter chide and make lament and are discontent, saying, why this awful frost? Why this hail and storm? Why not the balmy winter? Why not the eternal springtime? Why this injustice on the part of the creator? Why this suffering? What have we done to be meted out with this catastrophe? However, those souls who have lived many years and have acquired much experience 
and have weathered many severe winters. Realize that in order to enjoy the coming spring, they must pass through the cold of winter. So I grew up in the Baha'i community. My mother heard about the Baha'i faith when I was, when she was pregnant with me and became a Baha'i when um, I was three years old. So growing up in a Baha'i household, I already mentioned independent investigation of the truth. I knew that it was up to me to investigate, to find out whether or not this religion was right for me. And one of the quotes that I read early in my life was a quote from Abdul Baha that was we opened with here today that talked about the reality of man as a thought. And up until this point in my life, I always thought that that was spiritual and esoteric and somewhere outside of me, instead of realizing that truly when Abdul Baha says the reality of man is his thought, it is absolutely true. And science today is proving it. You know, as I mentioned before, the harmony of science and religion is one of the foundational pieces of the Baha'i faith. And we're going to do a deep dive into that today. So when I discovered Dr. Joe Dis Dispenza, he was really proving scientifically what Abdul Baha was saying spiritually. And he was talking about doing all kinds of scientific experiments to talk about how it is that we create our reality. So some of the things that have happened here is that we know that scientific research is proving that your internal voice is 10 times more powerful than what you hear others say. Do you realize that? Do you realize that the thing that you say to yourself over and over and over again all day long is 10 times more powerful than what others say to you? Science is also proving today that we have anywhere from 60 to 70,000 thoughts a day. And 90% of them are the same thoughts that you had yesterday and the day before that. So if we really truly want to make change in our world, we have to change the way we think. Another thing that science is proving is that when you say it out loud and you don't just think it, it's 10 times more powerful than if it's only in your head. Think about that. 10 times more powerful if you say it out loud. So when someone asks you, are you having a bad day? And you say, I'm having a really hard day. It becomes 10 times more powerful. Whereas if we could find something good to focus on, even if it's only one thing, having that practice of gratitude, it helps elevate in a different way. According to Christine Norad of the Harvard Business Review, when it's a negative thought, it is shown to have an influence of up to seven times higher. So these are really important for us to understand. And by the end of this talk, I'm going to tie it all together as well. Studies show that if you start your day off with the news, which typically is very negative, you are 27 times more likely to say that you had a bad day than maybe if you were to wake up to music that is uplifting to you or to prayer and meditation. Um, you know, we really have to be very careful with what we allow into our sphere because everything is energy and everything has an effect. You know, one of the videos that I'm going to show you today talks about average people do not become average because of behavior, but because, I'm, I'm sorry, because of average behavior, but aptitude. Aptitude does not just define what ends up happening in our life. So if we find a way to start our day off with prayer and meditation, and to live in the present now, instead of the familiar past or the predictable future, how would our life change? The law of substitution says that if I think about what I have to do next, my mind will move there. And if my mind move, moves there, my behaviors will follow. So if I'm thinking about all of the challenging things that are going on in my life, 
I'm moving to those situations. Whereas if I'm thinking about elevating the conversation, I have a different option. And our mind is a very powerful, powerful tool. So they've been doing all kinds of scientific research with functional brain scans. And in this particular experiment, they had participants take a functional brain scan at the beginning of the experiment, experiment and then five days later after practicing scales. And what they had the people do is they had people, they had two groups. There was one group that actually practiced scales for an hour a day. And there was another group that only like closed their eyes and mentally rehearsed practicing scales. And what science is proving is that our brains do not know the difference between actually experiencing and doing an event right now or thinking about that event in our minds. So it was really incredible what happened because neuroplasticity in the brain showed that those people who mentally rehearsed practicing scales had the same amount of neural receptors in the brain as the people who actually moved their fingers and practiced the scales. There was another example where they took a group of college, college students and had them pull a string for an hour a day for four weeks. Then they had another group of students do the exact same experiment, but they never moved. They were only told to like practice it in your brain, mentally rehearse it. The people who pulled the string had an increase in their muscle strength by 30%. And the students who only mentally rehearsed had a muscle increase of 22%. That's pretty incredible. So if we really realize how powerful our mind and our brain is, then we have to be very careful about what it is that we're thinking about. So I want to share with you a short video here. And this is Dr. Joe Dispenza talking about how it is that we create our reality. How many people in this audience actually believe in the idea that the way you think has some effect on your life? So how many people here actually woke up this morning and consciously created a future? You know, the biggest reason why people don't do it is because you don't really believe it's true. You see, if you knew on a gut level that it was absolutely true, would you ever miss a day? Come on. And would you ever let any thought slip by your awareness that you didn't want to experience? So if you believe this then, then does your environment control your thinking? Or does your thinking control your environment? So if you wake up in the morning and you get out of bed on the same exact side as you did the day before, you shut the alarm clock off with the same finger, you slip into your favorite slippers, you shuffle into the bathroom and you use the toilet like you always do, then you get into the shower and you wash yourself in the same routine way, then you groom yourself to look like everybody expects you to look, then you go downstairs and you drink coffee out of your favorite mug, then you drive to work the same way as you did the day before, you see the same people that push the same emotional buttons, you do the exact thing that you know how to do and you memorize and can do so well that you're an expert at. Then you hurry up and rush home so you can hurry up and check your emails. So you could hurry up and go to bed so you can hurry up and do it all over again. Now, here's my question. Did your brain change at all that day? We could say that you were thinking the same thoughts, performing the same actions, that create the same experiences that produce the same emotions, but secretly expecting something to change in your life. As you see the same people and go to the same places and do the same things at the same time, it's the external environment that's turning on different circuits in your brain, causing you to think equal to everything that you know. 
And as long as you think equal to everything that's familiar or known to you, what do you keep creating more of? Same life. Now, the quantum law is still applying to you. You're just thinking equal to everything that you know, and you keep creating more of the same. To change, to truly change is to think greater than your environment. And every great person in history knew this, whether it was William Wallace or Mahatma Gandhi or Martin Luther King or Queen Elizabeth I or Joan of Arc, they all had a vision. They all had an idea, couldn't see it, couldn't smell it, couldn't taste it, couldn't feel it, but it was alive in their mind. It was so alive in their mind that they began to live as if that reality was actually happening now. So can you believe in a future that you can't see or experience with your senses yet, but you've thought about enough times in your mind that your brain is literally changed to look like the event has already happened? Neuroscience says it's absolutely possible. 95% of who you are by the time you're 35 years old is a set of memorized behaviors, set of emotional reactions, beliefs, perceptions, attitudes that run just like a computer program. So 5% of your conscious mind begins to work against 95% of what you've memorized. So the person wants to think positively, but they're feeling negatively. They want to create their dream board, you know, and put up their future life, but they feel unworthy. That's mind and body in opposition. We have to recondition the body to a new mind. To change your mind then is to make the brain work in new sequences and new patterns and new combinations to begin to make the brain work differently. And the one ingredient that allows us to do that is knowledge or information. Because every time you learn something new, you make a new connection in your brain. That's what learning is. Learning is forging new connections. Remembering is maintaining or sustaining those connections. Write down the choices you have to stop making. Mm -hmm. Look at the things you have to stop doing. Do you complain? Do you make excuses? Do you blame other people? Mm -hmm. What do you do? List those things and be really honest with yourself. What experiences do you have to stay away from from certain people at certain times? Mm -hmm. Stay away from them mm -hmm. so that you are not in the environment that mm -hmm. triggers it. So, a show of hands, how many people in here believe that they create their reality? Not just think it, but absolutely believe it. It's something that is very interesting to really come to terms with, right? Because then we have to become responsible for really everything that happens in our life. How many of you know what happens in a brain as you're learning something new? Anybody, has anybody ever seen any of the functional brain scans or to see what happens inside the brain? Okay, I'd like to show you what happens because of what it is that we think about. And this is done through, um, you know, neuroscience technology to take a look at what is happening to the brain. And one of the things that Dr. Joe Dispenza spoke about just there in that video is how it is that we have to change the thought, right? We have to become familiar with what it is that we need to achieve in our lives and be conscious of our thoughts. And one of the things that Abdul Baha says is that when a thought of war comes, replace it by a greater thought of peace. A thought of hatred must be replaced by a greater thought of love. So how many of us actually do that exercise? You know, a, a year ago, I had a, a, someone make a racist comment that I knew online. And for like three days, I was judging this person for making a racist comment. And one morning when I'm brushing my teeth and the thought came again, my judgment of this person, I thought, oh my gosh, like I'm the person that's in the wrong here. Like, okay, so if I'm supposed to take that thought and replace it, how can I amplify growing up in the Baha'i community? One of the things that my mother always taught me 
was that, you know, Abdul Baha said, if a man has 10 qualities and nine of them are bad and one of them is good, focus on the one that's good. And I thought, okay, how do I do that? Okay, this person creates beauty everywhere they go. This person is incredibly generous with the people she loves. This person loves deeply their family. So once I did that, I never again judged this person. So it works. Like all we have to do is find a different thought to replace it with. And the more we fire and wire those neurological networks in our brains, the more our brain actually changes. So here's a short video on what happens with our thoughts as we are thinking all the different things that we're thinking. So there is also another principle in neuroscience called Hebbian learning, but it's actually the opposite. It says nerve cells that no longer fire together, no longer wire together. And the universal law is you don't use it, you lose it. So then I call this the science of changing your mind. And it's a very important slide for you to pay attention to. I call it throwing out the mental trash. So when we see people trying to make new connections in their brain, the biggest problem that they have is there's a lot of chatter going on when they first start out. So they sit down and they say, okay, what is it like to be happy or what is it like to be healthy or what is it like to be a leader? So they're going to fire this new thought. If you look at that blue neuron we just passed that's connecting to that body of a, of a neuron, that blue neuron represents a new thought, like I'm a great leader or I'm healthy or I'm happy. So you close your eyes, you put your body away, you eliminate the environment, you retreat from your life, you forget about time, you fire this new thought that says, what would it be like to be a leader, to be happy, to be healthy? So as you fire this new thought and you start thinking about it, all of a sudden, you start to hear all this chatter in your brain. You're not a leader. You're too much like your father. You're a failure. You're never going to change. You know, look at all these things you did. You're never going to be healthy. Look at the pain in your back. The doctor told you this. Look at all the past problems you've had. Your life is a wreck. All of that chatter is the old circuits that have been firing and wiring all along behind the scenes of your awareness that you haven't been paying attention to. Now, all of a sudden, you become conscious of those unconscious thoughts. So as all this chatter is going on, you're trying to select one thought that you want to put your attention on. So as the chatter and the voices are going on trying to talk you out of greatness, we have this one component uh, as human beings called our will. And our will is connected to the spirit. And if we continue to persist, firing the same thought over and over again, silencing the other thought, sooner or later, this becomes the loudest thought in your head. The moment this thought becomes the loudest thought in your head because it carries the greatest amplitude, the action potential is traveling from the presynaptic cleft to the postsynaptic cleft, and the circuit has to be sealed. But the neural growth factor travels in the opposite direction, from the postsynaptic cleft to the presynaptic cleft. So there's only a certain amount of neural growth factor to grow around. So as we're sealing the circuit of being a great leader, being healthy, being a, a, a happy person, it starts to seal the glue from the other circuits. So there goes the thought you're never going to change. There goes the thought of the pain in your back. There goes the thought that you're too much like your parents. And you prune away the old circuits because the new circuit is taking the neural growth factor from it. This is called pruning in neuroscience. And this literally is the science of changing your mind. And people who make transformations, they all say the same thing. They say it was like that problem, that part of my life, that personality was completely another lifetime. I'm somebody else. I've been born again. Now think about this. So there is also another principle in neuroscience. So the science of what Abdu'l-Baha said about replacing that thought is scientifically backed up through functional brain scans. We can see that we can change our reality based on our thought. And we have to do this because if we don't, then we 
go into that subconscious program that breaking the habit of being yourself, if you will. So going back to my original story of just being in this dark night of the soul that I was going through, I had discovered breaking the habit of being yourself. I'd been listening to the audiobook, and I was on a trip from DC to New York on a bus. And I was on one of those mega buses that is fancy and has Wi-Fi and all that stuff. And I had brought my computer to do some work. I was going to visit friends and family and I get on the bus and the Wi-Fi is down. And I'm like, oh my gosh, what am I going to do for the next four and a half hours? And it's hard to read on a bus. I tend to get motion sickness when reading in a car or on a bus. And I had been listening to Breaking the Habit of Being Yourself and had been saving audio clips that were significant to me that I wanted to return to. So I thought, well, let me refresh myself on where I was and start listening to the audiobook on this ride. And the most incredible thing happened as I'm listening to these clips, he gives a formula of how it is that we create change in our lives. And he says that the first thing you have to do is to create an intention. And once you've created that intention, you need to go into meditation. And for me, that is combined with prayer. So prayer and meditation. And, you know, meditation means the, the definition or the meaning of the word meditation means to become familiar with. A lot of people say, oh, I can't meditate. I'm not good at it. But how many of you have been good at something the very first time you did it? So how, you know, part of what meditation is, is a practice. And the more we do it, the more we become better at it. And it's really important to put that time aside to really go internally, have that conversation with your soul and really put whatever intention you are looking to do out in the world. So he says to go into the meditation process, you create an intention and then you match that intention with an elevated emotion and that you should not get up from your meditation until you can live in the emotional vibrational frequency of how you would live if that intention had already happened in your life. And I thought, oh my gosh, that's something that I read when I was a teenager from Shoghi Effendi called The Five Steps of Prayer. So let me take you there in our PowerPoint presenta presentation. So, Shoghi Effendi said, the dynamics of prayer for solving problems. First step, pray and meditate about it. Use the prayers of the manifestations as they have the greatest power. Then remain in the silence of contemplation for a few minutes. Second step, arrive at a decision and hold this. This decision is usually born during the contemplation. It may seem almost impossible of accomplishment, but if it seems to be an answer to a prayer or a way of solving the problem, then immediately take the next step. Third step, have determination to carry the decision through. Many fail here. The decision butting into determination is blighted and instead becomes a wish or a vague longing. When determination is born, immediately take the next step. Fourth step, have faith and confidence that the power will flow through you the right way will appear, the door will open, the right thought, the right message, the right principle, or the right book will be given to you. Have confidence and the right thing will come to your need. Then as you arise from prayer, take at once the fifth step. Act as though it had already been answered. Then act with tireless, ceaseless energy 
And as you act, you yourself will become a magnet, which will attract more power to your being until you become an unobstructed channel for the divine will to flow through you. Many pray, but do not remain for the last half of the first step. Some who meditate arrive at a decision, but fail to hold it. Few have the determination to carry the decision through. Still fewer have the confidence that the right thing will come to their need. But how many remember to act as though it had already been answered? How true are these words? Greater than the prayer is the spirit in which it is uttered. And greater than the way it is uttered is the spirit in which it is carried out. So when Shoghi Effendi says, act as though it had already been answered, and then act with tireless, ceaseless energy. And as you act, you yourself will become a magnet, will, which will attract more divine power to your being until you become an unobstructed channel for the divine power to flow through you. That was exactly what Dr. Joe Dispenza was talking about in Breaking the Habits of Being Yourselves. You have to set that clear intention and match that intention with the elevated emotion of how you would feel if that intention had already come true. And when you do this, he says, as you send the intention out into the world, you yourself become a magnet and attract to you that which is which you are putting out into the universe. And I was just blown away because it was just this beautiful marriage of science and religion. And it was very interesting. I was taking the train into New York City that day and I had shut down my cafe a few months earlier finally and I was starting to heal from the devastating effects of that financial failure and still in the process very much of trying to clean up that aspect of my life. And I am on the train and I decide to go into a 15 minute meditation because I feel like, well, I'm not a very good meditator, but I could sit quietly for 15 minutes. That's something I can handle. And I decided that day to sit in joy and gratitude and just feel the emotions of joy and gratitude for 15 minutes. And it was incredible. I had tears running down my face. Like, you know, it was just, it was a very moving experience. And I had a, it was interesting. I've always had this like passionate love for Oprah Winfrey. When I was 14 years old, you know, I absolutely believed that some days, someday we would be girlfriends and I'd run home from school every day and like sit in front of the television and watch her. And I just, she was my hero. And she had been a part of this journey for me too, because one of the places that I turned to, as I mentioned in the, in the intro, is that, you know, I was listening to every podcast that uplifted humanity and anything that just brought joy. And Super Soul Sunday was one of the places that I turned to. And Oprah was in New York at that time. And I thought, wouldn't it be cool if I ran into Oprah on the streets of New York today? Because I was going to be walking around New York all day with my nieces. And I had an amazing and a glorious day in New York with my nieces and my sister, Amy, who came in and surprised me. And the next morning we had to rush back to DC for a show. And I'd found out that Dr. Joe was doing a a progressive event in Lima, Peru, like a week later. And I thought, oh my gosh, I want to go and learn about this work. I want to do a deep dive. And I get back to the convention center and they asked me to open up a second kiosk that wasn't planned for. And I said I would do it as long as I could find the staff that was available to come in because it was very last minute. And I kept thinking, I really want to do this, but how can I? And I just kept going back and forth. Is this responsible? But I'd been living my life for everyone else, you know, for the past couple of years. Like I wanted to do something that would spiritually nourish me. And I thought, well, you know, I had a job two weeks ago that made really good money. So I think I can, you know, go to this progressive event. 
And when they added the second of the second kiosk, I was still kind of on the on the you know fringe of should I do this or shouldn't I? But when they added the second kiosk, I knew that I was going to make extra money. And interestingly, I made exactly within fifty dollars what it cost me to do that trip. Like act as though it has already been achieved. <laughs> That is truly what happened. And the next morning, Monday morning, one of my staff members comes in 40 minutes late. And I said, you know, I really appreciate working with you, but I can't run a business with people coming late, 40 minutes late. I said, if you want to continue to work with me, we've got to figure out how to get you here on time. And he said, I know, I'm sorry, Miss Faith, with, but with Oprah being upstairs, <laughs> she was in my building. Like, I didn't even have to run into her on the streets of New York. She came to me. <laughs> and, the, you know, think about what I said. Wouldn't it be wonderful? Wouldn't it be great if I ran into her, you know? So there she is two days later um, in my building. So I really saw quite purposefully exactly what was being put out there. I want to share one more video before... I move on to meditation and then close. But this video talks about what it is that we think about ourselves and how that creates our reality. I wanna apologize in advance. There's a few words that aren't appropriate for, um, there's a few cur curse words in there, but I will try to mute them out if I can, but if I'm not able to, please forgive me. But I think we're all adults here and we'll be good. So this is Trevor Moad, and he is a specialist in how it is that mindfulness creates our reality. This is one of my most favorite videos. I think this is a good time to tell the, the story. Story. Yeah. And I want to preface by saying you told this at the dinner. And at the dinner, you spoke for five minutes. But, yeah. but this, I was like, no way. And I went and told everyone the rest of the week. Yeah. And then I called you back yesterday. I'm like, bro, was that story real? Because I've been yeah. telling it all week. Right. And I think the reason why it's so good to tell is it's the epitome in a very understandable, entertaining way why mindset is so important. Right. Give it to us. Well, you know, this focuses on this idea of the, something called the, the Pygmalion effect. And, and so the Pygmalion effect is very real. Right. So as it was told to me, by my dad mm -hmm. and um there's a speaker series that anybody on this podcast could get involved with called toastmasters mm -hmm. and toastmasters is an international group that um has there's a toastmasters la there's a toastmasters arizona where you can you know sign up and be a part of local groups and you work on speaking not improv but kind of like that and it's a professional speaking group then they have national events well my dad you know had a chance to hear one of the top magazine entrepreneurs tell a story um, at uh, at an international Toastmasters event. And he would share the story with me as a really kind of two pivotal moments that really jump out at me in my, in, in my life to understand the power of our own behavior. Yeah. So this guy um, was a high school student who was a fuck up, mm -hmm. right? And he was struggling and he was about to get kicked out of high school. So if you could do it wrong, he was doing it. Yeah. And But in the 80s, there was a test, and a lot of people would know it, called the SAT. Mm -hmm. And the SAT, it's been modified since, but back then it had two parts, math and verbal, 800 points. He promised his mom he would take the test. Okay, So he takes the test. He expects nothing, but he takes it for his mom. Yeah. And he takes it in May, gets a score back in June, and to the surprise of everybody, he gets a 1480 out of 1600. So his mother, as I shared with you, doing what any mother would do, she said, did you cheat? Right? <laughs> because she knows her son and he must have cheated because the score isn't in alignment with who he was. Yeah. Or in psychological terms, it would be called cognitive dissonance, yeah. right? Where you see an outcome that's different than who you think you are. Yeah. He said he tried to cheat, right? But the spacing of, of the chairs was too much. The numbers were too small on the number two pencil that he literally took the test. She said, you mean to tell me you're that smart? He said, all I can tell you is I took the test. So he's fucked up, mm -hmm. but he also recognizes like, oh, 
I might be smart. Yeah. So, so now he's weaponized in a different way. So because he thinks he's smart, he says, I'll go to, because I'm smart, I'm going to go to class as a senior. He's still enrolled. Well, now he goes to class. He doesn't hang out with who we used to when he didn't go to class. Yeah, the dumb kids, because now he's a smart kid. Right? Yeah. And so teachers see him and said, you know what, maybe we missed the boat on him. Yeah. Right? So he graduates, goes to a community college, goes on to a four-year, and then ultimately goes on to the Ivy League. And as the story is told, becomes a, one of the top, most successful magazine entrepreneurs. So you hear like, okay, well, obviously he had the gifts. He just had never unlocked them. And this, mag this test just he caught him on a good day and he got behind the real gifts he had. And he says, no, that's not the story. He said, the story starts 12 years later. I get a letter in the mail from Princeton, New Jersey. Don't think anything about it. And uh, next day, his wife says, you're going to open it. He opens it. Well, it turns out the SAT board, which is true, which happens every year, yeah. reviews their test-taking procedures and policies. The year he took the test, he was one of 13 people, sent the wrong SAT score. Yeah. The actual score was a 740 out of 1600. And as my dad would say, the whole crowd gasps. Mm -hmm. Right? The whole crowd gasps. And he says, people want to say it's the 1480 that changed my life. When in true, acting like a 1480 is what changed my life. And what does a 1480 do? They go to class. Yeah. So... Damn it, that's good. What it tells people is that your behavior, not your aptitude, defines you. Yeah. And what we think our aptitude is shapes our behavior. Yeah. So what is unique about Russell Wilson. I think that story is so appropriate to talk about what it is that we think about ourselves what it is that we create in the world, how it is that we create a reality. So, you know, when Abdu'l-Bahá talks about the reality of man is his thought and how we need to use the meditative process to learn how to become one within ourselves, this is scientifically backed up. So Abdu'l-Bahá says, reflect upon the inner realities of the universe, the secret wisdoms involved, the enigmas, the interrelationships, the rules that govern all. For every part of the universe is connected with every other part by ties that are very powerful and admin of no imbalance, nor any slackening, whatever. He says, I charge you all that each one of you concentrate all the thoughts of your hearts on love and unity. When a thought of war comes, oppose it by a stronger thought of peace. A thought of hatred must be destroyed by a po more powerful thought of love. Thoughts of war and destruction, I'm sorry, thoughts of war bring destruction to all humanity harmony, well-being, restless, restful, I'm going to start over. Sorry about that. Thoughts of war bring destruction to all harmony, well-being, restfulness, and content. Thoughts of love are constructive of brotherhood, peace, friendship, and happiness. So, there's quite a bit in the Baha'i writings that talk about meditation. And I think a lot of us think that meditation is like, I don't know how to sit and not think about anything, but there are all kinds of different types of meditation. I personally do the best. I personally do the best with guided meditations, but here is what Abdul Baha tells us regarding meditation. He says, some thoughts may be of little or no use. They are like waves moving in the sea without result. But if the faculty of meditation is bathed in the inner light and characterized with divine attributes, the results will be confirmed. And in one of his talks, Abdu'l-Bahá describes prayer as conversation with God. And concerning meditation, he says that while you meditate, you are speaking with your own spirit. In that state of mind, you put certain questions to your spirit, and the spirit answers. The light breaks forth, 
and the reality is revealed. Baha'u'llah has written, meditate profoundly that the secret of things unseen may be revealed unto you, that you may inhale the sweetness of a spiritual and imperishable fragrance, and that you may acknowledge the truth so that the light may be distinguished from darkness, truth from falsehood, right from wrong, guidance from error, happiness from misery, and roses from thorns. We are living at a time that is so divided, and we don't know what is right, what is true, what is true in the world. So here, Baha'u'llah tells us to meditate profoundly so that these secret things may be un, these secret things may be revealed to you. So we really have to pull upon meditation for guidance. You know, one of the things that I love that Dr. Joe Dispenza talks about is that we have to take a chance on possibility. That to know yourself is to know God. You know, what does Baha'u'llah say? Love me that I may love thee. If thou lovest me not, my love can in no wise reach thee. You know, he talks about if we knew that we were the creators of our reality and not the victims of our circumstances, then how would we live our lives? If we truly believed that we created our realities and we did that through the meditative process and prayer, would we ever miss a day? He says that stepping outside of convention is where miracle, miracles happen. On the other side of your giving up is your freedom. So many people give up just before the miracle happens. How is it that we stay consistent and we keep going? Again, through that meditative process, who do I want to be when I open my eyes? And his advice is don't open your eyes until you can live in the emotional feelings of who that person is. He says that when you change your emotions, you change your mind. When you open your heart, your life will change. And this is probably one of my most favorite talk things that he says. Know that the divine matches your efforts. Keep going, keep practicing, you will create your reality but we have to meet it halfway. Again, going back to Abdu'l-Baha, meditation is the key for opening the doors of mysteries. In that state, man abstracts himself. In that state, man withdraws him from all outside objects. In that subjective mood, he is immersed in the ocean of spiritual life and can unfold the secrets of things in themselves. This faculty brings forth from the invisible plane the sciences and the arts. Through the meditative faculty, inventions are made possible, colossal undertakings are carried out, through it governments can run smoothly. Dear God, please let our leaders start to meditate. <laughs> through this faculty, Man enters into the very kingdom of God. And I want to end with this beautiful quote. This is a quote from Abdu'l-Baha about joy. And this piece of artwork that you're looking at right here is done by the beautiful Alice Williams. And she has created a book called Joy Gives Us Wings. And it's all quotes that Abdu'l-Baha um, has given us about joy. And I want to end with this quote because what we've been talking about all day is how our thoughts create our reality. And the more we can focus on joy, the better our lives will be. And Abdu'l-Baha says, joy gives us wings. In times of joy, our strength is more vital our intellect keener, and our understanding less clouded. We seem better able to cope with the world and find our sphere of usefulness. 
again, in times of joy, our strength is more vital. If any of you are interested, you can, she has a beautiful book. Um, you can email her at alicewilliamsphoto at yahoo.com. And there, this is a trilogy. So there's three books, Gather All People, um, which is celebrating quotes on diversity. Joy Gives Us Wings, which is about service to others and how we find joy in this world. And then the third is about our healing. And I just wanna take a moment to thank everyone. This is that beautiful book that I pulled that quote from, and I can put it in the chat if anyone would like it. And I want to open it up to questions. And thank you so much for your time and attention this morning. Thank you so much, Faith. That was a really, really useful and um, uplifting, inspiring talk. Thank you so much. And I think it's a topic that can obviously literally affect all of our lives. So Thank you. Um, if anyone has any questions, you can go ahead and put it in the chat. We have some time for questions right now. I guess I'll, I'll start it off while we're waiting. Um, so what, you know, do you have any practical advice for, let's say someone who is not feeling in a joyful state and they're not, you know, their vision is clouded what, you know, sometimes it's hard to just switch to a new mindset. How, what advice do you have for kind of like transitioning into that? So I think each of us have different things that we can do. One of the things for me is music. Music always puts me in a different state of being. And I also turn to prayer and meditation. And if you're not able to get to the prayer and meditative state yet, then maybe even just like, finding something that is uplifting. So for me, that was Super Soul Sunday conversations or podcasts about other entrepreneurs who had had great struggles and found a way to come out of it. It gave me hope. So it really is doing what Abdu'l-Baha taught us to do, like taking that, he says, you know, when a thought of war comes, oppose it by a greater thought of peace. Like we have to literally change our, train our brains, train our minds to when we're think when I'm thinking I'm overwhelmed and I'm not like, there isn't enough time. Every time I think that thought, I replace it with everything happens in divine order. There is plenty of time, you know, so you have to literally change just like Abdu'l-Baha told us, you have to replace that thought with another thought. Thank you. Um, okay, we have a question that says, if you do not reach your vision, how do you keep yourself motivated to continue your meditation and vision? Huh. <laughs> well, I think for me, one of the things that I've realized is that I first want the will of God in my life. So my most important thing is that my prayer is that I am accepting because I don't know what's best for me. Only my creator does. So I will put an intention out into the world knowing that this is what I'd like. However, God knows me better than I know myself. So if this isn't something that is good for me, then please don't allow it to, to manifest. Because sometimes what we want is actually something that will, is not good for us. So I think that, you know, the more we practice, we have to have faith and we have to have hope and we have to have reliance in the creator. So, you know, take small steps always, but if you're living in that emotional vibrational frequency, as if that thing had already happened, then you're better off anyways, regardless of whether or not that thing ends up coming true. But that, you know, that's a, that's a spiritual way to look at it. Um, so I'm not sure if the um, question wanted that kind of spiritual answer, but, um, you know, I think we often are materialists. And when we say we want certain things and we don't get them, we get frustrated. 
but maybe those things aren't very good for us. So I think that, you know, the, if, if you're questioning whether or not you can achieve it, you're probably not going to bring it to you because you're not in that state of being. Shogi Effendi says you have to act as though it has already been achieved. So it's not enough to um, put the thought out there without the energy of how you would feel. Okay, I have another question to piggyback off of that. Um, so, you know, you were talking about how, you know, changing your mindset to think, you know, things are meant to be, or we pray for divine will. So what do you do if, if someone is praying for divine will, but they also have a lot of regrets and guilt about their own actions, you know, because not everything happens according to divine will. Sometimes we have a factor in our own lives. So, you know, how do you kind of like reconcile those two things? Well, I believe that we absolutely have a part to play in every situation. <laughs> we are the creators of our reality. Um, you know, one of the beautiful things in the Baha'i faith is that we are, there's really no place for guilt in the Baha'i faith. There's, I've never found anything in the writings that talks about guilt. And interestingly, we are people who are every day, at the end of every day, asked to take ourselves to account. And so we're asked to do two things. And it's interesting because most people only focus on one, but the things that we're asked to focus on are two things. What have I done that is pleasing for my Lord today? And recount that and ask it to be strengthened for all eternity. The second thing that we're asked to do is what have I done that was not pleasing to my Lord today? And we are to recount those things and ask to do better tomorrow, to ask for forgiveness and to do better tomorrow. So really there's no place for guilt because if we're always focused, it's almost like every 24 hours we have a we have a do-over. So yeah, we have done some things in our lives. None of us are perfect. Every single one of us probably has something that we feel shame around and or guilt around. But it does myself definitely no, not only does it do myself no good, it will greatly impact my life if I focus on that. Because what happens is my brain lives in that state. We are always living in one of two states. We're either living in a state of survival, which is stress, or we're living in a state of creation, which is health and well-being. And so if I'm constantly living in a state of stress, then I, my brain is sending, you know, instructions to my adrenals to release those fight or flight chemicals. And that, and that creates disease in our bodies. So we have to know that when Abdu'l-Bahá is saying like, joy is the best cure for our medicines, it's better than a hundred thousand medicines. I'm sorry, joy is better for our illnesses. It, it is better than a hundred thousand medicines. Like that is a really profound thought. Like we have to know that we cannot focus on the ways that we've fallen down. We have to take account for it. We have to ask for forgiveness where it is necessary, whether it's of God or of a person. And then we have to do better tomorrow. But we have to take action. Thank you. Um, okay, we have another question kind of following up um, saying, let's say you wanna be more patient and you meditate on it, but you fail at being patient no matter what. How do you practice what you meditate in real life? Well, I guess my question for that individual is, are you living in the emotional vibrational frequency? Are you acting as though you're already patient? Because if you're really truly like acting, even if you have, I, I remember a friend of mine, the same friend that I told you I called and said, my life is falling apart and I need help. And she, you know, she was like, I'm sorry, I have nothing for you. Like there was a day where she called me to check in on me and she was like, Faith, how are you? And I was like, you know, I'm really great. Nothing has changed in my life. I shouldn't be great, but I'm choosing to be great. And, and, and I was like, I don't know if I'm a fool for doing this, 
but I'm definitely a lot happier than I was three days ago when all I wanted to do was like hide under my bed. And so like, if you want to be more patient, you have to act more patient. Like, I'm sorry, it's really that like, and you need to, you know, we need to turn to prayer and meditation. Okay, so if you can't meditate for 15 minutes today, find three minutes to breathe deeply and to shut down that sympathetic nervous system. You know, if you can just find three minutes to breathe deeply, to hold that breath and then release it for the same count, whether it's three to five seconds, then you will shut off that autonomic nervous system, which shuts down the fight or flight response. Another thing you can do if meditation isn't your thing, like run really fast for three minutes. That too will shut down that fight or flight system. But we have to take action. And again, we have to replace it and practice being patient. And the more you practice, I promise you, the better you'll get at it. Thank you. Um, someone's asking if it's possible for you to talk to Oprah about the faith. <laughs> you know, Rain Wilson did an incredible job at that. And if you haven't ever heard that conversation, I highly encourage you to um, go on YouTube and look up Rain Wilson and Oprah Winfrey. It was an interview about Soul Pancake, but like, as I remember it, like 80% of it was all a conversation about the Baha'i faith. And the first time I heard that, that um, interview, I cried the entire time because I was like, that was the conversation I always knew as a 14 year old I would have with her. <laughs> and I was so excited that someone had had it. I was so excited that it was rain. And um, so yeah, she's very familiar with the faith. And um, if you listen to that, interview, you will really love what she has to say. And I, I, hey, if it's, if it's God's will, someday I will have a conversation with her. So we'll see. And I can't imagine um, not talking about the faith when and if I ever do have a conversation with her. <laughs> do you have any other questions? We have a couple more minutes. Okay, well, if not, thank you so much again, Faith. That was really great. And I'm glad we recorded this. And afterwards, we can all go back and listen and meditate and try to really apply this to our lives. So thank you so much again for joining us today. Yeah, thank you for having me. And, you know, I just really want to encourage people, like one of the things that um, I learned through this process, like even though there were all these quotes from the writings about meditation and I grew up as a Baha'i, I'd never really focused on them. I'm, I, as you know, as a community, we talk a lot about prayer, but we don't focus very much on med meditation. And, you know, meditation is really important. And I would really encourage each of you to find a practice that works for you. Um, I really think that it's the only way that has, I've been able to change my life over the last few years. And we want to change our lives without taking the steps necessary to change our lives. So again, if you really want to um, create greater change in your life, you have to go through prayer and meditation. Mm -hmm. Definitely makes sense. Thank you again. So next week, our speaker will be Mr. David Langness, and he'll be speaking on the Baha'i faith during Nazi Germany. So again, these talks are every Saturday, noon Eastern time. And if you're not on our mailing list, I'll put a link to our Google form in the chat, uh, as well as our YouTube channel. Thank you, everyone. See you next week.